Sudden Rush girl. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anything else you want to know? <laughs> Sudden Rush's song, Me Nong, was the first Hmong rock song that I was totally into. And the fact that the singer was a female, it really resonated with me. We do get mistaken for being from California, Minnesota, etc., wherever else, but um, now we're from this tiny little place out here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Maple Ridge, yeah. Wow, I didn't know it was already 10 years. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, this song, I when it first came out, it was so popular. Um, everybody has to uh, sing it. I didn't even think about it until it was brought up that it's been 10 years. And, and uh, yeah, it's been amazing. A lot of positive feedback, you know. And it's brought us a long way. Because to me, I don't know how other people interpret the lyrics, but to me, it's letting go of your problems. You know, not just like a person, but letting go of your problems, moving on and growing up. So to me, no matter what, since it's something that inspires me, I feel like the song will never age for me. And she just came to me and said, hey, you know, we should write some music. And I said, yeah, for sure. So It was so, like, it was so hard, like a hard rock song. With, with a ballad flavor to it and so I like me as a band with my very first band we had to learn that song to perform at the New Year's and almost like every band back then played it at the New Year's. Definitely feel older, <laughs> wiser, uh, seen a lot more at that time, uh, I can say it, 10 years younger makes a big difference. It's a major song, I mean uh, I think it was one of the f uh, first big hits in our Hmong music industry you know, uh, with the great with the great groups like Paradise and Destiny, you know that that song definitely gets put up there. You know, with the music that they created, I look at them like legends too. You know, uh, that song is legendary to me, so obviously it has impacted me as a kid too. Never expected how far it go, and here I am. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be the drummer today for Sudden Rush. During that time, there was not a lot of female singers that can pull rock like uh, Pat does in Sudden Rush. So she really inspired me to, hey, if she can do this, I can do it too. Yeah. My dad used to make me go to home school on Saturday mornings, and so I was the I was the only kid in the family that uh, had to endure that. <laughs> but at the in the end, it, you know, it, it worked out really good because although we're not around home people um, as much as we would like to be, and I don't get to practice the language that much in terms of my written home because I was officially taught how to read and write it, um, I feel like that was a huge advantage for me in terms of like songwriting. Yeah, well growing up in Vancouver, we weren't very exposed to much Hmong music at all. The only Hmong music I was exposed to was uh, the band that my brothers played it before we started Sun Rush. There's 
two populations in Canada, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, one community living near Toronto, Canada, which is kind of our New York, uh, which only has about maybe 3,000 Hmong people. So it's a bigger community for Canada, but uh, not so big for the United States, I believe. Maybe they might have three to 4,000 now. And then the other uh, population is where we live, the community, and we have probably about maybe 200 people, 300 people max. So everything that we've learned about Hmong people has been added through you know, our parents' wisdom, our elders' wisdom, what we watch in movies, um, and just talking to our friends and family that live you know, in those areas. We do miss Hmong people, so sometimes when you miss Hmong people, it's, uh, you gotta travel quite a bit to go out there, but uh, other than that, it's, it's nice up here. It's our own little uh, part of the world where you, sometimes if you need to get away from uh, the Hmong world, you can. It was very important to the first um, refugees, Hmong refugees of Canada, that we had to keep our heritage. So um, we set up schools with the sponsors for making sure that the whole new generation still knew how to speak Hmong, still know how to write in Hmong, and hence why Sudden Rush was still able to do what we did, right? And we didn't have like opportunities to, um, you know, visit Hmong stores and have access to Hmong music and stuff like that. Having access to all these different things that were related to being a Hmong person, whether it be food or music or clothes or jewelry and things like that, um, we kind of felt like, you know, when we went to Hmong New Year, it was our one opportunity <laughs> to do like all our shopping and to, to get all these things that we kind of represent our culture. The way for us to reach out to Hmong people we found was, was through our music, you know. And that's kind of one of the things that drives us too. Throughout my earlier years, I played with you know the guys from high school, uh, Ken Roger. They played with with my uncle and uh, my little brother Chinu. Like he was just a kid, and all of a sudden he became this crazy guitarist. So he was just kind of his own thing, you know. He just kind of came out of nowhere. Pat, she's always been like. A vocalist. According to my mom, when I was a baby and not even talking yet, and you know, when she would feed me, she said little breaks in between feeding, I would like just sing random songs that made no sense, but I would sing. <laughs> so I guess it's always been in me. I just just didn't know. <laughs> they told me strictly do not touch their instruments, <laughs> but I played it anyways. Eventually, eventually, I got to a point where I played so much that I got to a point where I was on par with them now. That's where I became part of the band, right? Because I played so much, but it was it was very distant. Yeah, I was not allowed to go near the instruments. I would only sneak in when they were out of the house. The real geniuses are, you know, uh, Joe and Chinu of the uh, of Sudden Rush, and they composed everything to um, the point where I can add my flavors. Sometimes it can get pretty hectic for us uh, as being siblings. I think if we weren't siblings, we probably would have broke up a long time ago. But uh, because we're siblings, it, it helps us because we've got one common goal, basically, and I think we can all relate to that. And uh, besides that, uh, we don't want to fail one another. Basically, if I fail one of my siblings, I'm failing myself. My brothers, you know, they've had a lot of you know stage experience. They played with other bands and whatnot, and I was kind of like you know that quiet person that would I would work on art on my own time and uh, I'd never really share it with people. I'd, you know, I'd work on stuff and then just tuck it away. What my main contribution to the band is I do, I do a lot of the background stuff in, in the music that we don't really see up front. Um, usually anything from the arrangements to the final arrangements. want to contribute to the evolution of Hmong music. Don't get me wrong, we enjoy playing covers and jamming out cover songs. It's so much fun and we want to pay tribute to all those bands that we love and everything but what's most important for us is, is, is bringing Hmong music 
further into the future. So we've always felt that our time was better spent writing new material, putting out new material, and helping the evolution of Hmong music. Because of our chemistry and our history of having the same musical influence, it's uh, what is created for me already beforehand will be very similar to what uh, I will add to it. I definitely add in um, any opinions or any changes or what my thoughts are for uh, what the song may sound like or should sound like or whether it's going to be a fast song or a slow song or and the whole band is very open to what everybody's opinion is for it but um, for the most part uh, they're great at what they do and they make my job easy I, I just try to do my best to keep up with them and do a good job as a drummer I think uh, the best thing uh, about Sudden Rush is uh, we work as a whole unit What's up, guys? What's up? What's up, what's up, man? What's up? So happy to be here. Oh, no, glad you guys are here. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you, you guys. for everything. Yeah. Glad you guys are here. Of course, of course, absolutely, guys. Hey, you guys, you realize we have not played since like. One day my wife and I were hanging out and I just had it on a cassette tape, on a playlist, on a cassette tape, that's old, and I had it playing and um, she heard it and she was like, hey, what, who, what band is this? You know, and I was like, oh, that's, that's my band. Oh, what? She was like, it's really good. And she doesn't listen to Hmong music, but she felt it was really good and she's like, you should put it on MySpace. And I was like, no, I don't want to do it. She's like, no, you got to put it on MySpace. So she heckled me. So eventually I put it on MySpace. Say, hey Pat, we're putting it on MySpace, let's see what happens. And we're like, okay, cross our fingers, put it on MySpace, and boom. We had like a whole whack load of hits, comments, and all this kind of stuff. He wanted more. So, yes, you know, I, I, I would like to give the credit, you know, to my wife. She's kind of the inspiration behind everything that I said earlier that led us to be Sudden Rush, on my part, at least. Yeah, overnight. I remember at one point when I looked, it hit about thousand, a hundred thousand views within that first two or three days that, that, that we put it up on MySpace. And I don't even think it was the full demo, it was probably just a clip of the original demo. And uh, yeah, I think from there it really made us, pushed us to go and record the actual the actual track that was eventually released as a single. My main goal every time I write a song, or every time I write music is, it, it has to be so intriguing in the first five seconds or so of the song because when people hear a song, when I hear a song, you know, the first five seconds will draw me in to listen to the next five seconds, you know, and so on and so forth. And before you know it, you're through the whole song. It's one note, one vocal melody, one word. If it's not pleasing to the ears or it's not pleasing to the listeners, they're just gonna, you know, next song. For me, as far as writing songs go, we write a song, it's done, we move on. But this song kept coming back, kept coming full circle. Like, hey, that song that you guys play, you know, right? You know, like, how did you do? Everyone asked the same questions. And yeah, it brought us to so many different, you know, places on so many different levels. And people still talk about it to this day. And uh, to, to for, for one particular song to still be relevant after 10 years, um, you know, it's a special song to me. At, at the beginning, I was quite annoyed at the song. Uh, at that time, I was not part of Sudden Rush, and Joe and Pat, they were when they were still writing the song, um, at that time, they would come and they'd practice downstairs underneath our house, and every day I'd hear the song, and I was just like, what is this song? It's, it's so annoying. They'd play it till late in the night, and I'd have to work the next morning. I wanted to write something that was both tragic but um, had a sense of hope tied into it and I feel that he knows that like it's it's tragic but it's not like if you listen to it in its entirety um, it's also about strength so yeah I think that's why people connect with it because it's like we all experience those things but 
we get you know we get through them and uh, it's great to see people with different age groups connect like you know whether we're traveling to California and we meet a person who goes oh yeah like you know when my when my dad passed away like my mom would listen to your song they're like what <laughs> she's like 60 right so that feels good it's a good pick-me-up song to you know make me help me get past uh, a struggle in life right because we played it at um, um, funerals you know, for uh, grandparents and it meant that at that moment um, for losing a loved one as a uh, um, um, uh, wife or husband or girlfriend or boyfriend and it meant that too. It's metaphoric so it doesn't have just to do with one thing it can be for any any kind of situation that relates to that. I think that's what the song is intended for, and I think it serves that purpose quite well. That song really proved to me that, you know, music can speak for itself. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, even, even to this day, there's a lot of people out there that know our music that don't know us and have never even seen our faces probably, have never met us, you know. Um, but they know our music, you know. No matter what, you can say, hey, you know Sudden Rush? They say, no, I don't, and you show them the song. Oh yeah, I know that song. This is the set that we just created. There's Sudden Rush. And... Hey, Tata, you're king guy. One, two and a half we go. <laughs> 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 kind of goes back to, I think, us living so far away from the home people that it was kind of an outlet for us to connect. Um, and at first it didn't really matter to us whether we were a home band or an English band or any kind of a band. We just wanted to make music. Um, but we were fortunate enough that um, the very first song we put out there, it just took off. And um, it just happened that it was a Hmong song. And so that was the first audience that we had um, any sort of connection with and exposure to. You just kind of blew up and I was just like, really, this song? And yeah, it's, it's special to me because uh, up here in Canada, we don't have that much Hmong people. So I didn't really see the Hmong world or see Hmong people and because of that song um, it because everybody loved it, it it allowed me to go out and uh, share that song with the rest of the Hmong world and I think I might even said oh, this, you don't, we don't want to release this as the first song right you know in all honesty right I mean you never know uh, with music and as an artist you take a leap of faith and you do what your heart tells you to do and you hope that people uh, love your art for what it is because you you're inspired by what you love and you're not just going to do what other people want and you do what you want to do and and you want that recognition for what your heart's telling you right and I and that's I think that's where Mino came from you know going out there and presenting a crowd with something that they've never heard before but to make it even more like <laughs> nerve-wracking is you know those those lyrics that you're singing like they came from somewhere in here and you're kind of going okay how are they gonna you know are they gonna boo me <laughs> how are they gonna receive this right so I think at the end it, it was um, a lot more rewarding a great thing is this music has allowed us and has given us the door to travel and we get to go to these small communities and to the big communities and you'd be seeing Hmong people everywhere and we're like it's very much live um, it's very inspiring. It's really uh, we still get the awe, you know, the uh, the uh, of of seeing Hmong people. We're very we're very happy to see Hmong people all the time. Just the song alone, the people knowing knowing that, and the ones who have finally, or who eventually dig into to it and find out who we are, able to call us to go down and play for them. It's quite the experience, actually. You know, we went from being this little band from Maple Ridge, you know, Vancouver, Canada, to our first show. It's kind of it's kind of funny because when we went back, I said in a rush for the first time. I was like, "Hey, you know what, guys? We always came to the New Year to go, you know, 
be at the new year we're part of the new year now we were we're here selling our cds and then people are waiting to go to our concert tonight like it, it was it, it's a total different feeling you know being at the new year and people are coming to see us rather than you know us going to see others right uh, i believe it's reached from end to end um, everywhere I've, I've been, uh, I've, I've seen videos on YouTube and just people all over the world, uh, just people uh, commenting, you know, on Facebook and stuff like that, to where even the smallest towns where only one or two Hmong families live, uh, they've said that they've got our CDs, uh, people in France and Thailand, just seeing the Thailand bands play our songs too, it didn't, it, uh, that's like... You know, the biggest honor for us. I just, you know, I always thought that maybe I, I would write songs and someone else would sing them. But because we were in a community where there was no one else, <laughs> and me being a female and um, writing songs, you know, from my perspective and stuff, like, I wasn't sure if my brothers even really understood them. Because I remember, I remember Mino had already been recorded and we already had, like, it was already done for a few years. And I remember Joe was sitting around, and I think his wife was there, and we, we were laughing about something. Thing and he goes, I finally understand what the song means. <laughs> and he's like, oh, so that's that's what the lyrics are all about, right? And he's like, it's actually a really good song. <laughs> I was like, Canadian, Canadian fried chicken. Canadian fried chicken. <laughs> yeah, Canadian fried chicken. Yeah, different. Right. <laughs> a little bit different. Thanks, guys, for getting dinner. No Thanks for getting everything else, man. Yeah. <laughs> we feel bad. Our saying is visiting us from a long ways away. We don't get very many visitors, usually it's set a rush on the road. But uh, it's a pleasure to have a visitor this time. So. Alright! In the early years of our band, you know, we, 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 we didn't know any better, you know. We just would cross the border like anybody else. We'd take flights out, you know, to the States and, and just come down and play shows, you know. No harm, no foul, you know, we didn't think anything of it. We're really looking forward to our first true uh, concert where we were in the main headliners and uh, we were super excited about it. And then uh, right there, like, you know, we were just hitting it big. We were just getting out there and, and travel, starting to travel a lot more. And all of a sudden we were just hit with a brick wall. And it we were all traveling across the border, like how we normally do. We were driving down to the States and we are gonna fly out from Bellingham. And, uh, you know, myself, Roger, and Cam, you know, we went first. And then as we were boarding the plane, you know, there was no Pat, no Chinu. So we thought maybe Pat was late, like usual. You know, she's always late, right? So we thought she's just being Pat. They'll catch the next flight or they'll drive straight to Seattle and catch a flight with us in Seattle because we're going to fly to Seattle, change planes, and fly again. So we got to Seattle and we're waiting. We're going to board the plane again. No Pat and Chinu. We're like, it's possible, still Pat. You know, so away we went, landed in Sacramento. Later on that day, I got a call from my sister um, telling us that Pat and Chinu had been barred from entering the U.S. for five years. Blew my mind. Totally blew my mind. I was like, what the hell? We have a concert to do, right? You know, if it was going to be five years, it could be lifetime easily. Uh, we didn't know what the future was going to, was going to hold for us. So we kind of just, you know, laid back and hoped that things would go well. But uh, at the same time, uh, I mean, we never gave up on music. Uh, we continued writing, uh, continued doing what we do. But at the same time, we we just felt bad for everybody too because, um, I mean, it's, it's more on a personal level. We didn't want to share too much with everybody too in case, you know, a lot of people might not understand or it might uh, backfire on us legally too. So we kind of had to just hold it back, although we wanted to let the world know and all the fans know where we were at. I'm sure we all thought about it. Well, I'm pretty sure it's over, right? And uh, But as year three came by and year four came by, you know, the the phone calls started coming. It's, it's four years, right? So, you know, come New Year next year, is it five years? And, you know, all of a sudden the inspiration came back because I guess we were, as we were thinking about whether the world was still thinking about us, it was, they, they were thinking about us, and that inspired us to, oh man, we better get this second album, you know, going again, right? Long story short, you know, we didn't have the proper work permits, and, you know, to to allow us into the States to, to, to work. Was at a point where we're like, 
we're going to continue to do this because the first year was like, yeah, we're still going to do this. But as five years trailed on, you know, we we were at the tip of finishing the second second album already. But of course, that put got put on hold because we we're a live band. We don't we didn't believe in putting a CD out there and having it go all on YouTube and then not ever performing one song for the next five years it didn't make sense to us so we would release we wanted to release the album and tour right away and play it so it's like yeah it's a rush it, it, i don't think it would have brought any credibility to how we perceive ourselves as artists right as musicians uh, we want to take that leap of faith put out our music and say here we are again and and show them live that you know we're back right it feels really awesome <laughs> it does yeah i can't believe it's it's been that long like the time has gone by so fast um i know we haven't been exactly you know the most active in the last few years uh, you know of course just coming with age and growing up and responsibilities and the guys getting married and families and stuff it, it, it's challenging to you know to find that time to get together and to write and to to rehearse and to to feel inspired right but um it feels really good that even though we haven't been around showing our faces or doing anything, that we're still being remembered. <laughs> so, for me, it's all about playing live. I'm not much about me, you know, doing pro recordings and stuff like that. For me, it's more being on stage than in the studio. Um, when we first came back, we played at Myth uh, 2016 uh, in Minnesota. Uh, it was a bit nerve-wracking. <laughs> to say uh, we were you know we haven't been in front of a big crowd for a while so uh, especially a home crowd and yeah I, I was a bit nervous because we were there a few days early and I got to meet a lot of the fans and stuff too so nervous and excited at the same time and uh, yeah we, we got through it but uh, once we got on stage and everything was going again and then drilling going and back in the mood and it was yeah it was, it was all goes from there and yeah we were super excited after that it got a little tougher, you know, to travel. I heard a little more to leave uh, uh, my family because all the Hmong parties, you know, they started during the holidays and, you know, uh, every travel, every show would be Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, I'd kiss my kids goodnight and hop on a plane and, you know, fly out to Cali or, uh, you know, Minnesota or wherever we were going. And it would always be the case, right? We, I think for, one year, uh, it was almost every weekend that we were gone, right? And even our wives started to complain, you know, like, you're never home, hon, right? And I say, you know, it's it's tough. Every joke, it's tough being a rock star, right? We've grown and we've matured and uh, we have a better sense of who we are. And, um, of course, you know, inspirations change, right, as we age and through our experiences. Um, I think, if anything, our, our music is way more true to who we really are now. Not that it wasn't back then, but you know, we've grown, right? And um, it doesn't matter as much whether anyone likes it or whatever, as long as we're happy doing it. Um, but we're definitely, we're definitely working on new music, and of course, you know, music videos with you guys. It took us 10 years to to start, but. Um, I think that after this experience, and it's been a great experience, so I do want to thank yourself and uh, Creative Results for giving us this opportunity. Um, but I think I, I see more music videos in the future. <laughs> All right, this is our second time ever that we're going to play this song as a band, so we hope first we don't time. mess up. First time. First time. First time. First time. First time. First time. Second time. First time. <laughs> Just for you. Just champagne. First time. The same made us do the champagne shot like three times. We did drink every time. Sen corrupted us with beer and, and champagne, and, and now he's filming us. Forcing us to play. Pressure. Pressure. He taught us more pressure. Eventually, we got through the hurdle, and yeah, it's, it was a great relief that we were able to come back, and the, the fans who uh, always supported us were always there. And uh, when we came back, they were still there, so they showed us a lot of love in that way, and we uh, appreciate it. Constantly feel inspired, you know, and I'm always wanting to write music, and I'm always wanting to share music with the rest of the world and all of our fans. Um, so if I have it my way, um, Sun Rush is going to be around. For a while. We had a lot of time to think about 
what was good for our lives outside of Sudden Rush and our lives including Sudden Rush and if we wanted to make this a uh, long-term path for us and a long-term joy of ours that we wanted to do forever for a long time that yeah you got to think past just today yeah you go through this certain thing through in life that everyone goes through eventually um the song will come around too your friend's probably going to show you the song right and you'll be like oh yeah it hits the spot it's like love you know there's there's never hate in music it's always to me there's never hate it's it's always positive and keeps me positive I think the biggest uh, inspiration for me knowing and after 10 years getting on stage and still hearing the crowds sing the song back to you I think that, that that's the biggest feeling of we made it it's you know it's a great reminder that um, you know we can't quit anytime soon <laughs> and we're not planning to it's just that you know life gets in the way but it's it's great when these things do come up because it just reminds us of, you know, why we started in the first place and why there's no expiration date to your passions. nowadays to grow up and listen to my music and I want it to never get old you know just like the song me know it'll never get old it's it, it's like it's timeline is forever you know um, that's the kind of impact that I want to leave as well so that's the kind of impact that song has on me for sure as an artist um, 10 years from now I would still want them to sing like you know my song like how 10 years like even 10 years for Poe you know I'm still singing me know and that's what I want to like be or do in the future or leave behind for my band. My biggest passion and biggest vision is just seeing that the Hmong people have something that they can call their own. Someday we will catch up to what the mainstream is doing and we will know that it's a Hmong person due to the genre, due to the style that they're doing and hopefully we get there soon and by doing what I do, I hope that we can inspire other artists to do it better than us. You know, and I think that's what I've always felt with Sudden Rush them, is that they inspired me to do what I do. If they had not started their journey, I would not be where I am right now. So it's a huge thanks to them and all those that came before them that we're here today with Mo Music. ตาฟ้าชีเตียนอตอนุจเกวลาลัว